What is going on, everyone? Welcome in to the reveal of the number 31 team in my 2022 NFL Power Rankings with a deep dive into the Jacksonville Jaguars. Before we get started, please do hit that like button down below. I put a ton of work into this series, and that like really does go a long way towards pushing this video out towards other NFL fans just like you and towards helping me reach my goal of 100,000 subscribers this year. Also, with that said, make sure you do subscribe down below so you do not miss a deep dive as we count down to the number one team in my power rankings. But without further ado, let's get into the Jacksonville Jaguars, who ranking 31st here after picking number one for the second year in a row. Now, the Urban Meyer era came and went faster than security footage at a Columbus bar, but here we are. This team is retooling and reloading and trying to take another crack at becoming a real competitive, good football team with their golden boy, golden haired quarterback, Trevor Lawrence. Let's take a look at their busy off season here. And of course that starts with this massive overhaul of this staff. Now I'll do a staff breakdown here, get into the scheme in just a second, but uh, just to highlight basically a complete turnaround here. New head coach Doug Peterson comes in and Urban Meyer out. Now, when I ranked the Jags a little bit lower than Jags fans wanted to see last year, a big source of my pessimism was a lot of skepticism around Urban Meyer and the potential for him to really be a fraud. And that played out, you know, Doug Peterson I don't think he's a fraud, um, but man, I'll just say for now, there's a really good reason he was fired uh, by the Philadelphia Eagles, and I'm not exactly glowing with optimism about this hire either, although it's better than Urban Meyer. Um, Daryl Bevel out, and Zach Taylor's brother, Press Taylor, is in at offensive coordinator. Uh, same thing, change on the defensive side of the ball as Mike Caldwell is going to come over from Tampa Bay. Uh, so again, we'll break down this staff here in just a moment, but uh, a complete overhaul of the coaching staff in Jacksonville and much to the chagrin of Jags fans, Trent Balky, by the way, is still there as the general manager. Offensively, they are losing uh, quite a bit of talent, though they've made good efforts to replace guys at those positions. So uh, DJ Shark is gone. He only played four games last year, but definitely a player I wouldn't have personally let out the building. Offensive line-wise, losing three starters. AJ Can wasn't able to stay healthy last year, but Norwell and Brandon Linder, two very good guards, and or a center and a very good guard. AJ Can good himself. So basically a new look interior offensive line for the Jags. And then Jihad Ward, who played about half of their snaps last year as a pass rushing specialist. And Miles Jack, who has departed to Pittsburgh. Now on the bright side, they have basically replaced all of those positions they lost. So you look at the wide receiver room, they bring in Christian Kirk, kind of the laughing stock signing of the offseason, a massive contract. Now, not quite as big as the face value looks like, but heavy expectations for Christian Kirk to come in and be this team's number one wide receiver. They do get Travis Etienne back, one of their first round picks last year, who, uh, man, did he even play at all in the regular season last year? I forget if it was preseason or week one that he got hurt, but uh, basically a rookie season for Travis Etienne. They signed Zay Jones, not entirely sure why with Marvin Jones on the roster, but he's there now. Evan Ingram is brought in uh, as a receiving tight end, so they made some efforts to address the playmakers here. Luke Fortner is going to step in at center, going to compete uh, for a, a starting job there, third round pick out of Kentucky. Brandon Sheriff, a really nice signing at guard to replace one of those two losses with Can and Norwell on the way out. And then on the defensive side of the ball, really adding a lot of good talent to that side of the ball. They signed one of my favorite defensive tackles in the NFL, Falorenzu Fatu Kasi. They draft Trayvon Walker, number one. Surely to be lots of discussion here in this video about that pick. Arden Key, who had a nice season for San Francisco last year, will add some depth to that edge group. And then Devin Lloyd, Foyasad, Aluakun, Chad Muma, all coming into this linebacking room. Significant investments, to say the least, in that linebacker room there. And then Darius Williams gets brought in here 
And I have some thoughts on that signing as well once we get into the defensive roster breakdown. But uh, a very busy offseason for the Jaguars. Definitely a net positive. I mean, they threw so much at getting better as far as spending and free agency. They had a bunch of picks. They overhauled the staff. They should be a better football team next year, but you can say that about every single team. It's all about how much better did they get relative to the rest of the league. And I have some some question marks about that uh, question as we head forward here, and that starts with the staff. So let's cut to the chase. I rank Doug Peterson as the worst head coach in the NFL. Now, he's a much better head coach than Urban Meyer, who was also the worst head coach in the NFL last year. Look, I get it. He he won a Super Bowl in Philadelphia, and you can't be a fraud head coach like Urban Meyer was and win a Super Bowl. I understand that. But there's a very good reason the Eagles fired him. When you look at what happened to that Eagles team and organization basically after they won, when Frank Reich leaves to go be a highly successful, well-respected head coach for the Colts, he was their offensive coordinator in that Super Bowl season. Basically, from the second he left, their offense started to look disoriented and their culture started to fall apart. And by 2020, you can check the receipts. This is not me being some Jaguars hater. When he was still on the Eagles before he got fired, I said on this channel that he is the worst head coach in the NFL and has got to go. I was well ahead of the game in saying that. And the reason I said that was because that offense was a disaster to watch. What I said at the time was the Eagles are leading the league in a um, invisible stat known as snap to what the f is going on plays where running backs are running screens in the opposite direction of the blocking. Guards are pulling into each other. Carson Wentz is throwing the ball where there's no receivers like that offense had no idea what was going on. And you got to point your finger at Doug Peterson when he's your offensive mind, your offensive coordinator in that situation. Not to mention the culture was getting messy. There was tons of disagreements between players and front office and coaches. It was a it was a mess. And uh, you expect me to say that you put Doug Peterson back here in Jacksonville and that's just going to fix all of the culture problems that have existed in Jacksonville for the last five plus years? Uh, yeah, I'm not exactly buying that. So. I do have a lot of skepticism about Doug Peterson coming in here for the Jaguars, and I think that's all pretty damn justified. Now, he's a better coach than Urban Meyer. There's no way he could be worse. You can make a case that Urban Meyer was the worst head coach in NFL history, just based on what he did in this short amount of time that he had there. It was, it was a, I mean, we used disaster for the Eagles. I don't have a word to describe what happened with with Urban Meyer and the Jags last year. So you'll at least get a hopefully a better baseline of culture and coaching. But I don't know how much better it's going to be uh, as far as what Doug Peterson's offense is going to look like, as this is a coach and scheme breakdown here. Uh, Doug stems from the Andy Reid coaching tree, which Press Taylor as well, the offensive coordinator coming over from Indianapolis, who worked with Doug in Philadelphia, also stems from that coaching tree, of course, now also having worked under Frank Reich in Indianapolis, who is a part of this coaching tree. So as coaching hires tends to be in the league, a lot of nepotism, if you will, a lot of hiring guys you know that run similar systems. It's good process to get guys that understand what you want to do next to you. And I actually kind of like the Press Taylor hire. When I went back and looked at his resume, I do think he was worthy of a, an offensive coordinator position here, uh, having spent a lot of time as an assistant in this sort of tree and uh, working under Frank Reich in an offense last year that uh, I thought was really well operated. So for what it's worth, I do like the Press Taylor hiring. Uh, and you're going to see again, this sort of what I describe as a spread coast scheme. That's not something other people have uh, termed it as, but that's the way I view the Andy Reid uh, playbook, basically. It's a lot of shotgun. It's a lot of spread concepts with the heart of the offense stemming from that Mike Holmgren original West Coast sort of um, influence. And Andy Reid and Doug Peterson and uh, Adam, um, 
at of Matt Nagy have all kind of modernized the West Coast offense. So it's a lot of spread. It's a lot of inside zone running from spread. They've integrated RPOs heavily into the early down work. Um, quick hitting passing game that can operate as your run game. That is the offense here. And that's very much what Trevor Lawrence ran back at Clemson. And he's going to be very comfortable with this system. Um, and it's it's worked around the league. There's no concerns about the scheme here. It's more about coaching the scheme and play calling and establishing the culture when it comes to my concerns with this coaching staff. On the defensive side of the ball, I'm not going to lie. I like this hire as well. Uh, just kind of an unproven body here in Mike Caldwell has been under Todd Ball, uh, Todd Bowles basically for the better part of the last 10 years, going back to the Jets and the Bucks. And I love Todd Bowles, man. I am stoked to see him take over as the head coach in Tampa Bay. And he runs possibly the most unique scheme in the NFL. It's a very aggressive 3-4 front, a lot of excellent run blitzes, zero blitzes, zone blitzes, very good at confusing veteran quarterbacks, also very good at using the threat of that blitz uh, to create unblocked pressure, which is one of the best things you can do. No, no, screw that. It is the best thing you can do as a defensive coordinator. If you can show a blitz of six, but only send four, and because of that pre-snap look, confusing the offensive line to the point where you get a free rusher, you still get seven guys in coverage. I mean, that's like a glitch blitz in Madden. Like, that's a dream for a defense. And I would argue that Todd Bowles is the best defensive mind in the league at creating those looks for a defense. So if Mike Caldwell can channel that, you're going to be in business for this defense. I, I can't speak highly enough about that scheme and excited to kind of talk about how the um, players here will fit because as low as I am on this team, there is just so much potential. And I don't want to just, you know, dog on the Jags for having them 31st. I mean, I in general like a lot of the stuff they do. There's moves I disagree with, but it's all in front of them as far as the talent on this team, other than maybe the receiving room, which I'll talk about, um, and the staff. I, I do think these pieces make sense together. I would be question, questionable on if Doug Peterson is the right guy to be in charge, but way back in 2017, when he had a good staff under him, Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl. So it's hard to completely shred the hiring, but I am skeptical. It was really ugly the last time we saw Doug as a head coach. All right, now we get into the fun stuff, the roster breakdown, where we're going to start with the passing game here. And that means we get to start with Trevor Lawrence. And really, there's a lot of good stuff we're going to talk about in this video. But if the Jags don't walk out of this season with the answer to the question of, is Trevor Lawrence a franchise quarterback being yes, they have failed, period. It does not matter what else happens. If they have a great defense and win 10 games and Trevor Lawrence looks like ass, they've failed. So that is priority number one, two, three, and 10,000 for this team is to make sure Trevor Lawrence is everything you can hope for. Because if you want to talk about building an organization and expecting to win for 10 plus years, getting that dude is all that matters. Look no further than this Jags team who built a great defense in one year and then fell off the face of the earth. It's just not sustainable if you don't have that dude at quarterback. And Trevor Lawrence still has all of the potential in the world to be that dude. Now, you look at what they did to him last year with the Urban Meyer regime. It's like a freaking textbook for how not to support a rookie quarterback. Trevor Lawrence is a nearly perfect quarterback prospect when it comes to processing, off-field character, accuracy, tools. It was all just a matter of, as with any rookie quarterback, putting him in a situation where he has time to throw, time to learn the offense, time to get through his reads, and in a situation that isn't a train wreck so that he doesn't develop bad tendencies 
or that he doesn't get hurt. And when you watch the Jags last year, week after week, it was like, God, they couldn't be doing a worse job to give them receivers open, to give them receivers to catch tough balls, to give them good pass protection, to give them a run game, to give them a defense. <laughs> Everything that you can do to help a young quarterback, the Jaguars did not do for Trevor Lawrence. And it ended up in a situation where he looked pretty bad for the majority of the season. Now, he persevered. He did, to me, get better as the year went on. And my God, the flashes were absolutely there. He made some unbelievable throws that frankly may have gone undocumented last year because either people weren't watching this team or straight up receivers were just dropping those throws. Like his arm talent is legitimately top five in the league and he does it with a quick release. He has rare quick twitch athleticism for such a big guy. I mean, there's so much to like in Trevor Lawrence's game. I think from a processing perspective, he just, as with any rookie ever, has a long way to go, and they need to get that out of him, and that's going to be one of the concerns with Trevor Lawrence as we head into year two is how much is that development going to show. Really, the only thing that I can see potentially holding Trevor Lawrence back um, is I don't love his pocket feel. Just when it comes to that natural ability to navigate pressure, feel pressure, find the right spots to extend plays. It's not that he's bad at it. It's just he's not like Patrick Mahomes. He's not like Joe Burrow, frankly, when it comes to that trait. That's one thing that I don't know if will ever be brought out in Trevor Lawrence. But man, that's just one little thing. He has all of the potential in the world. And I rank him 18th coming into the year because I do think he got better as the year went on. I do think he's going to use his first full offseason as a veteran to good use. I think the coaching staff and um, the people in place will do a better job with him. But honestly, if he was only the 18th best quarterback in the NFL when the season ended, you're probably looking at, at that as a disappointment. You want to walk out of this year and say, okay, we have the best quarterback in this division. With You want him to pass up Ryan Tannehill. You want him to outplay Matt Ryan, and you definitely want him to outplay Davis Mills, which he maybe didn't do last year. So um, there's so much to like. It's going to be an exciting year to watch Trevor Lawrence, but the expectations and the pressure could not be any higher. And I'm a little bit worried about what they've done around him this offseason to ensure that you can get the answer to, is he a franchise quarterback? to be yes after this year and that starts with this receiving core and they signed Christian Kirk as like their big splash they gave him over 80 million dollars for four years that completely overpaid for him there's no arguing that they overpaid for Christian Kirk like they just did and they had to do that <sighs> man um like it's looking at it, it's like it's a bummer they soured their relationship with Allen Robinson. Like I would have so much rather given Allen Robinson the money he got than Christian Kirk, or I would have rather kept DJ Chark around. I I do not understand paying Christian Kirk this money. He was the third receiver in Arizona and arguably didn't even live up to that expectation. And it's not like he had a environment where he couldn't thrive in Arizona. He's got speed, but not size and elite speed to be a great vertical threat. He has the skill set to be an excellent slot receiver, but for whatever reason, Cliff Kingsbury never used him in that role, or at least tried not to. Here in Jacksonville, he's not going to be playing that role either. They're going to be asking him to be their true number one wide receiver, and he's not capable of doing that. I, I don't even think it's a situation where he can say, oh, he might get better here. I genuinely think he is what he is. He'll probably produce a little bit better because he's going to be the primary target getter. But man, I just do not understand saying, okay, we got Christian Kirk. We're good. Like, I think signing him is fine. If you also drafted a wide receiver early or signed another guy, but to only do that. Okay. Um, they do bring back Marvin Jones, who was a solid like possession receiver for them. He's getting up there in age to expect him to be anything better than he was last year is lofty expectations. 
They have LaVisca Chenault is kind of that playmaker type who will probably play a lot from the slot in this offense. He'll catch a lot of RPOs and bubble screens. Would love to see them get him involved on uh, design touches. And, and that's really his game. He's like, you know, everyone wants to compare everyone to Debo Samuel these days, but he definitely is in that mold where, and, you know, Niners fans will get upset about this. And Debo's obviously on a whole nother level, but LaVisca's skill set isn't route running and winning jump balls and all this stuff. It's put the ball in my hand and I'm going to be a running back after the catch. He's a glorified running back that plays receiver and he's good at that. He's incredibly strong with the ball in his hands. And when slot corners and safeties try to bring him down, he just shrugs them off like a fly. So there's something there in LaVisca Chenault. Ideally, you start to see what happened with Debo and he develops his routes and he gets better with his hands. But LaVisca is also just not nearly as explosive as Debo Samuel is so that those route running abilities can translate. Um, I'm not going to call LaVisca Chenault a bust. I still think there's a lot there and a better coaching staff might be able to get more out of them. Like Urban Meyer was playing around with freaking Tavon Austin and um uh he's here Jamal Agnew is a former corner like why are you messing around with that stuff when you have LaVisca Chenault here that you could develop but that all was just very weird I I, I this is a big year for LaVisca Chenault and I still believe in him uh, but I also don't think he's ever going to be this great separator type um then you have Zay Jones another wide receiver signing that I was just like why uh is he better than Marvin Jones probably not they're very similar players. They're solid number two dudes. Marvin's better. Zay Jones had a good year for the Raiders last year, but three years, 24 mil for him when he's like a replaceable starter type wide receiver four on most teams. And he is your wide receiver four here. Didn't really understand that. Like you have Laquan Treadwell here, who's comparable as well. You have decent depth there, but none of those guys are anybody that a defense is accounting for or you know taking note when they take the field you have jamal agnew who's going to return kicks and i don't know if he's going to have a big role that was kind of one of urban meyer's pet projects and that's probably your six the only other guy i would say keep an eye on here is kevin austin really athletic receiver out of notre dame who was wildly underproductive uh, but the traits are there he could um pave a, a roster spot for himself here as a special teamer uh and and stick and potentially develop here everyone else here is most likely going to get cut uh your tight end group has a couple good receiving threats evan ingram dan arnold this coaching tree has always emphasized that receiving tight end travis kelsey uh, the bears try to do it with matt Nagy, with jimmy graham wrong player but right thinking and then um, in Philadelphia, they had Zach Ertz. So a tight end that's going to play a lot of slot wide receiver being Evan Ingram, Dan Arnold, two very similar players. I had nothing wrong with the Evan Ingram signing, former first round pick, just a much better athlete than Dan Arnold. Uh, teams have been trying to get Evan Ingram to have an ounce of consistency for years. I doubt that's going to stick. Uh, just like most balls don't stick when they hit his hands. But in theory, someone that can get schemed open very well, an explosive player after the catch, wouldn't be surprised if he broke out here in Jacksonville, but I definitely would not count on that. And frankly, I wouldn't count on him to for sure be a better player than Dan Arnold, who actually is pretty good as a receiving tight end. Neither of these guys can block, so that's what Chris Manhurts and Luke Farrell are there for. Um, but all these guys, I think, will be in the mix and a part of a rotation at tight end. Um, then you have Travis Etienne coming back. He should be a weapon for them in the receiving game. Their screen game in theory should look much better this year. And that should be something that helps out Trevor Lawrence quite a bit. And Travis Etienne was a really explosive receiving back. I mean, Urban Meyer drafted him and like tried to make him a slot receiver for a little bit. I think a lot of that was overstated, but, uh, there's something to it. He has kind of a unique build at like six foot, 210, maybe 5'11", 210. That's actually right around where Debo is built, actually. Um, but yeah, he has good receiving skills for sure. And 
Uh, definitely can exceed that 78 grade that I give him there. He, he has a ton of potential to become one of the best receiving backs in the NFL and give you that sort of Alvin Kamara impact in the receiving game. Uh, you would be stoked if that happened. That's uh, a lofty expectation, but the potential is there. You also have James Robinson, another good screen guy. He doesn't quite have the route running and separation and speed that a guy like Etienne does on third downs, uh, but man, whichever back is out there, you've got a reliable check down option at least and a good pass protector. Uh, beyond those two, Snoop Connor, kind of a power back out of Ole Miss, not much of a receiving threat. And Ryquel Armstead, I, I was stunned to find, is still on this team. We'll see if he makes it, but uh, he's, you know, replacement level. So there's your playmakers. I do rank them 30th. I don't like what they did this offseason. I got a lot of flack when I said this team should have considered a receiver with that number one pick just because that is exactly what this team needs to help Trevor Lawrence. I look at this group and you've got an awkward number one type that's probably just a slot guy in Christian Kirk. You have a couple of you know, wide receiver fours on most teams in Marvin Jones, Zay Jones, guys that are low end number two options. You got a playmaker type in LaVisca Chenault, some receiving tight ends and a good running back catching the ball to the backfield. That's about as bad as it gets. There's some potential there with guys like Ingram and Etienne, but man, I would feel so much better if this team had a Garrett Wilson coming into the, into the team, or if they were able to sign a true number one wide receiver in free agency instead of Christian Kirk. And they just didn't do that. So definitely the weakness of this team is that uh, weaponry in the receiving game. Their offensive line also is far from a strength. Uh, a lot of turnover on this group. They decide to stick with these tackles. And that was another conversation is should they go with an Evan Neal or an Ikem Kwanu with that number one pick. And frankly, I think that would have been a better selection than what they did with Trayvon Walker. But they stick with Cam Robinson. They give him the tag and then a massive contract extension. You know, you kind of got to pay these tackles if you want to keep, keep them around, but they could have just drafted one if they wanted to get a little better at that position, I guess. You know, Cam Robinson's fine. He's developed on a year-to-year -year basis. I don't really have any issues with him. He will lose. He will lean. He's far from a, a perfect pass-protecting tackle, but he's solid. And then uh, at right tackle, Jawan Taylor. I actually think Jawan Taylor's on the rise here. I, I don't mind him at right tackle. Uh, I thought he got better as the year went on. I think he has really quick feet and he's really accurate with his hands. His anchor is fine. His core strength is fine. He can get beat by power. So if he can continue to hit the gym and, and develop that anchor, he has potential to be a really good, you know, franchise right tackle. So I don't necessarily mind them giving him another year there. Uh, and then you have Walker Little here, who this team did draft in the second round. I also really like Walker Little. This was a pick I, I really applauded them for last year. He got on the field late last year and held his own. So you have three tackles here that frankly are all starting caliber players. None of them are superstars or maybe ever will be. I think Taylor and Little do have potential to eventually get there, but they won't give you that this year. The tackle depth beyond that is really bad. Koi Kronk and Torore. Uh, and then Will Richardson is kind of a flex piece, would probably be your emergency tackle if anything happened to Walker Little. On the inside, I got my concerns here for sure. You have Ben Barch at left guard who played last year. I like Ben Barch. I'm not supposed to like Ben Barch as a UST grad, went to the hated St. John's, but I do like Ben Barch. Do I like him starting in 2022? Eh, not really. Um, there's no reason he can't prove to be a starting caliber player, but let's just say it's unproven, especially in pass protection. I think he's really gritty in the run and, and has enough athleticism and play strength to be functional in this inside zone scheme. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more in the run game in a minute, but uh, as a pass protector, he just has a long way to go. He, he just does. Uh, same thing with Luke Fortner. I like what I saw from him as a run blocker out of Kentucky, uh, but from a pass protection standpoint, the foot speed, uh, ability to, to handle stunts and call out stunts and all that stuff, it's all going to be a massive question mark for him if he's the starting center. Uh, your other option is Tyler Shatley, who started, 
about half of last season. So it could go either way. I think it's honestly about 50-50 as far as who ends up starting there. I ended up putting Fortner in there because I think they might just go with the youth and hope he develops. Some teams in a rebuild like to just play the youth and hope these guys grow together. So we'll see what they end up doing. I will not be surprised if Fortner struggles and they go with Tyler Shatley, who did prove to be a functional backup last year, but I don't think he's ever going to be anything more than that. It's also not a guarantee that Ben Bart starts at left guard. I think Walker Little could potentially play guard and potentially be better than Ben Barch. Maybe Barch can play center. You have some flexibility in there, so I don't think this is going to be some nightmare situation. You got options. You got Brandon Sheriff. Love that signing. No complaints there, man. Um, better run blocker than pass protector, but very solid in pass protection as well. Not a guy you're going to run through easily. A tough guy to get around, one of the better guards in the NFL, and never going to complain about landing a guy like that in free agency. Uh, so the pass blocking is just on the cusp of like that, you know, right at the back end of that mid-tier of offensive lines. I don't think it's going to hold them back, but I also don't think Trevor Lawrence is going to be, you know, making sandwiches in the pocket or anything like that. Like that ball's going to have to get out. These guys will lose in pass protection, so... Uh, there is your pass game. They rank 28th for pass game. Given the fact that they have the 18th quarterback, that's kind of a detriment of the playmakers here, of what I'm expecting from this coaching staff, uh, and a little bit of the offensive line as well. But then we get into the run game. Ranks 29th as well. Not exactly ecstatic about this group, and a lot of that has to do, again, with the coaching and the run blocking here, because I like... James Robinson. I think he's a really solid top 15 back. I think Travis Etienne is going to give you some juice out of the backfield as well. Uh, it's a good running back room. They actually are a top 10 running back room in the league, in my opinion. Um, but when you get into the run blocking here, for one, I just, like I mentioned, when Doug Peterson was the Eagles head coach, you had guards literally pulling into each other every couple games. Like, the run game was not good under Doug Peterson, and I'm not confident that he's going to instill good coaching here in 2022 for the Jags. Um, but the players here as well, I have some concerns. Just with the offensive line, you know, you got two basically rookies there with Fortner and Ben Barch. You have Jawan Ju Taylor, who's just not the most powerful guy. He's not a people mover up front. He's athletic. He'll be a good screen blocker for them. Cam Robinson... Uh, just kind of struggles to sustain blocks sometimes, can struggle with his assignment awareness. Powerful dude, can move people up front, but uh, neither of those tackles have been excellent run blockers. And then you, of course, have Brandon Sheriff, which is excellent. Um, that's a force multiplier up front. He alone makes this, you know, brings this out of the bottom grouping of run blockers. Um, but you have poor blocking from these receivers. Marvin Jones has never been a good blocker. Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, Laquan Treadwell, actually particularly good run blockers, but from a snap count perspective, I'm not sure they're going to be out there much more um, than guys like Kirk and Jones. Same thing goes for uh, a tight end in Chris Manhurts, who's another very good run blocking tight end, but with what they want to do in the receiving game, you know, Dan Arnold, Evan Ingram, these guys are going to be your primary tight ends. I do like LaVisca Chenault as a run blocker, um, but I don't think this is a, it's going to, I don't think it's going to be a team that has anywhere close to good run blocking, even though they signed Brandon Scherf. I don't think that's enough. Um, but, you know, you have James Robinson, who's really good contact balance back, will fight for tough yardage. He will keep you from having an atrocious run game. And Travis Etienne, if you can give him a lane, is extremely explosive. Um, he himself has good contact balance in space. So these running backs will do a pretty solid job. Um, but again, I don't think this is going to be a very special run game. And that's yet another thing that is not helping Trevor Lawrence reach his potential this season. Um, the offensive ranking as a whole does rank 29th. So 28th for passing game, 29th for run game. I've got my pessimism for this offense. There's no denying the, poten the potential. 
Trevor Lawrence, you hope, has a huge year, and if he is outstanding, this is going to get elevated. Um, but there's also just not a ton of excitement other than him. When you especially look at that receiving group, I just would be so much more optimistic if I could look at a young receiver with true number one potential that could really open up everything for this offense. Because until you can get that, there's no one that defenses are really going to be afraid of in the passing game. Um, and they're going to kind of just let you do what you want to do and not be afraid of it. Uh, so 29th for offense. And then we switch over to the defense here. So the pass defense to me is a major question mark. Like it is question marks across the board. It's a unit that makes a lot of sense. I will say that all of the pieces make sense to me. It's just each individual piece is almost entirely unproven. So let's start with the pass rush where they rank 29th. A lot of potential there, right? Number one pick, Trayvon Walker, was drafted off of potential alone. Josh Allen, several years ago, was drafted off of potential alone, and he's still very much in his own right trying to get there. You know, I like Allen a lot. I think he's an excellent number two guy right now, and he's one good year away from being in that sort of Max Crosby, Rashawn Gary, uh, Brian Burns group of like good tier two number one guys for me. I think he can get there, but he has not gotten there yet. And last year was a bit of a disappointment for him. So that's a question mark, right? Trayvon Walker is the question marks of all question marks. The big question above all those question marks is why the hell did they take him number one? Wouldn't you so much rather that picture show Aiden Hutchinson or Kayvon Thibodeau, Jags fans? Because I sure as hell would. Trayvon Walker did not rush the passer at Georgia at all. A lot of that was scheme, but a lot of it is he just doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't have any pass rush moves. He doesn't have bend. Yeah, he had a great three cone, but man, as a true edge rusher, he is such a projection. He is physically speaking similar to Miles Garrett. If you're a great coaching staff, which the Jags don't have, let's be honest, you see Kalevon Chase on there? <laughs> yeah, he was supposed to develop too, and he hasn't done jack diddly squat. Now, you hope the new staff is better than that, right? But man, this team has done a bad job with developmental projects, and is that just going to change all of a sudden? I hope so, I really do. But Trayvon Walker has to learn a pass rushing skill set basically from square one. He's starting at chapter one in the How to Rush the Passer textbook. And that starts with how do you get a first step? How does he land his hands inside with power? He does, he has no idea what he's doing right now. And it's, it is what it is. I understand the upside projection for him. The dude is a freak, but he is typically what you talk about with you know, an Odafe Owe last year, who was at the end of the first round, a Gregory Rousseau, who was at the end of the, la the first round last year, a Rashawn Gary, who was a mid first round pick. And frankly, those guys all showed a lot more as pass rushers in college than Trayvon Walker did. So this pick did receive a D from me. I was not a fan. I would have so much rather they gone with a tackle or a different pass rusher or freaking I would have taken Garrett Wilson over Trayvon Walker, because I think he would have been more helpful to this team. So we'll wait and see. The draft is in the past. The selection has been made. It is what it is. Now we get to evaluate Trayvon Walker, the player, and see if he can be a better pass rusher than he was at Georgia. We'll see. I'm not going to say he can't do it. There's no reason he can't. Good coaching with his traits, he can get there. Um, but man, there's players that have comparable upside that can do it now. So I, I am going to be critical of that selection. Um, beyond those two on the edge, Dwayne Smoot is very functional, awkward build dude. Um, just not a great athlete, very unstable, unathletic guy, but man, he's got a lot of power. He's a super high effort dude. Good bull rush. Got some cross chop stuff in there. So I like Dwayne Smoot as a backup. Frankly, he's a better pass rusher right now than Trayvon Walker will be, but they're going to play Walker. Uh, Arden Key was a nice little addition. Played good, uh, played well <laughs> for the Niners last year. Um, a lot of it was schemed up, 
you know that's one of the better stunt scheming teams but in theory here they're going to be doing a lot of that stuff as a rotational dude uh, and maybe a mentor to Kayla Von Chase on a little bit because Arden Key for, was kind of Kayla Von Chase on for a while there former five star that never really developed got the right coaching maybe a good mentor for Kayla Von LSU connection there um, Kayla Von's a lost cause until proven otherwise has never put on an ounce of weight basically going back to his time at LSU he has no pass rush moves he has no power he gets bullied in the run game he's a weak side linebacker at this point in time uh, or a strong side linebacker uh, total project still still young former first round pick this is his probably his last year in Jacksonville to show that he can even do anything functional on the football field uh, Jordan Smith year two for him in development so that's probably your group of six right there uh, a lot of athleticism in this group, man. Other than Dwayne Smoot, it's it's one of the most athletic edge groups in the league. And there's no denying the upside, right? Trayvon Walker with Josh Allen and hell, even Caleb on chase on if he if something ever happened there, there's a lot you could do with those two guys. Um, but still a ton of unproven ability with that edge group. Uh, the defensive tackle group is mediocre i would say i actually watching this team back was really impressed from what i saw from roy robertson harris was a bright spot on that jags defense he's a very solid number two interior rusher athletic get off a pocket pushing type just kind of a handful um i i, I think he's going to provide some interior push i just wish you had someone else to give you a little more um Paul Lorenzo Fadukasi will be out there for a lot of those pass rushdowns, just as he was for the Jets. He demands double teams. He's a force multiplier in a little bit of a way. He has some power, but has never consistently won as a rusher. He's like a 15 pressure, two sack guy. <laughs> uh, a lot of that is the attention he demands, but uh, teams don't have to take him all that seriously. Though he does have some impressive pass rush wins on tape. It just doesn't feel like that's going to happen consistently for him. You know, Malcolm Brown, Devon Hamilton, nose tackle types, not expecting much from them. Jay Tefele could potentially give you a little bit more in year two. Uh, was a, a mid-round pick out of USC that I liked. Uh, some good quick feet, some ability to, to develop there, but you're not getting anything from him. Adam Gotsis, uh, kind of a backup to Roy Robertson Harris as that sort of three-tech gap shooting power rush role. And then Ledbetter and Raekwon haven't been able to stick in the NFL, so probably won't make the team here. So the pass rush ranks 29th. It's a complete projection. The upside's, you know, top 20, I think. If Josh Allen can take that big step this year, if Trayvon Walker can grow over the offseason and get better as the year goes on, this pass rush can get there. But week one, trotting out against, I think, the Colts, like, I don't expect them to get a whole lot of pass rush at all, just like they didn't last year. So I'm very much worried about that. As we shift towards the coverage conversation, I mean, I like the linebackers they have in coverage. Y you better like it after all they invested here. Uh, they cut Miles Jack and sign Foyasud Aluakun for $15 million. Really good man coverage linebacker, a smart guy. Um, has never been uber consistent uh a consistent in zone but still one of the better like cover linebackers it's hard to be consistent as a cover linebacker if you take risks and you make some plays as he does you're gonna get beat and honestly more or less that's probably better than just standing there and letting the quarterback manipulate you so i do like foya set um you know, you paid what you had to pay to get him here. It is what it is. It's he's you got you paid him more than he's worth, but um, he's a good play. So it is what it is. The Jags have a ton of cap space. I'm not going to shred that move. Um, Devin Lloyd in the first round. Again, you can see where he fits in here. Would I have rather them gone and gotten an offensive lineman for them or a receiver? Yes, hell yes. Uh, you got Chad Mooma in the third round, who's a great prospect as well, um, but he's here. He's going to be kind of the middle linebacker type, the sort of captain of that defense as a rookie. Really good zone feel, man. He has that sort of eye in the back of his head. He kind of carries uh, receivers in that second level very naturally. So if, say, a slot receiver or a tight end is running a dig over the top of his head and the offense is running a levels concept, He's very good at 
knowing what concept is coming and just kind of feeling out where it's where it's going and reading the quarterback's eyes while well, he does that. He's got a very rare ability to do that, and it's incredibly valuable. So I like Devin Lloyd. He was my number one linebacker, and they got him after Green Bay took Walker for some weird reason ahead of Devin Lloyd. So um, trading up for a linebacker in the first round when you needed some more help for Trevor Lawrence wasn't my favorite move, but I like Devin Lloyd, and I like how he fits in this defense, so hard to be terribly mad about it. Um, but when you get Chad Muma in the third, like it starts to make a little bit less sense. Uh, I would be just fine with Chad Muma starting here. I really like Chad Muma. He was my number four linebacker. I thought he was better than um, someone like Quay Walker. I think he himself showed really good coverage ability as well. Really fluid athlete, excellent tackler. Yeah, I don't quite get double dipping there when Todd Bowles and this scheme is traditionally a 3-4 base. Obviously, they have plans to run some 4-3. Most teams are a little bit multiple. Or maybe they just went with the double dip strategy and genuinely felt like they didn't need anybody on offense, which if that's the case, that's effing stupid. Um, but we'll see. They could be going some 4-3. Um, it's a good linebacker room, man. They rank 11th for linebacker coverage. That's not going to be the concern for this defense, I don't think. Um, Shaq Quarterman, Tyrell Adams, probably going to be the backups there. You're obviously not expecting much from them. Quarterman, more of a thumping run defender type. Uh, into the, the defensive backs, they rank 24th. I think there's way worse groups in the league. Y you don't really have a star player here. You got Shaq Griffin, who's a good number two corner, I would say. Uh, thrust into being their number one right now. Uh, no problem with, with Shaq Griffin. And uh, Tyson Campbell on the other side had a pretty good rookie year, and I thought he really got better as the year went on. Highly physical corner. Love him in press man coverage, along with Shaq Griffin. And these guys do definitely fit this defense. So you're going to see a lot of press man. You're going to see a lot of um, press zone match stuff. It's essentially a bump and run scheme for these cornerbacks, on, at least on the outside. And with Campbell and Shaq Griffin, it makes a ton of sense to have those guys. Um, and I I think Campbell will continue to ascend. I don't think Campbell will be a lockdown number one guy. He's a good, not great athlete. Um, but I think he could do a lot worse than these two guys. And they won't be a problem, but you know their win rate and lockdown ability isn't essentially a lead or anything like that but it's a good group let's talk about Darius Williams this to me felt a little bit like spending money just to spend money I don't entirely understand how he fits this defense really at all so if you look at what Darius Williams has thrived at and I love Darius Williams I don't get me wrong but he has been a perimeter off man zone heavy corner he is one of the higher IQ ball skill zone corners in the league, but he's 5'9". He's a poor athlete. He's not someone you want running press man coverage, which they're going to do in this defense. Everything else other than Darius Williams tells me this is a Todd Bowles defense from the corners to the defensive line. It all makes sense, except for Darius Williams at $10 million to play slot corner in a press man heavy system. Yeah, hard pass on that. I don't understand that signing at all. I think that was really just spending money to spend money. I think Trent Baalke looked and said, we need a slot corner. Who's the best slot corner on the market? Darius Williams. Oh, he's five foot nine. He's He's got a bunch of picks the last couple of years. Okay, he's our slot corner. I don't see that working. To me, that's in, in a to draw some parallels, I guess, to when the Raiders paid LaMarcus Joyner a bunch of money to go from the Rams to go to the Raiders and play slot corner when that's not what he was good at at all. He was a free safety and they paid him a ton of money to play out of position and he sucked. I can't fault Darius Williams for following the money. I guess, you know, I like Darius Williams. I think he's a good player, but I don't think he's going to fit what they do very well here. So if he really struggles and he gets cut in a year or two, it's going to make sense to me. So that one just didn't all add up. He's not going to be a liability. Like, he's a really good, smart player. He's quick. He's physical. He can hang in the slot, but he will get beat quite a bit in press man coverage. Uh, and teams will go at him. So we'll keep an eye on how that plays out. 
Um, your cornerback depth, Trey Herndon, is still here. You know, as a fourth corner, that's fine. He's got a lot of experience, very average, you know, NFL backup. Uh, they draft a couple guys here. Greg Jr., really athletic, toolsy dude. Not really ready to play right now, but a bit of a project. Monteric Brown out of Arkansas. I like Monteric Brown a lot, man. Really smart zone corner. Again, I don't really know exactly how he's going to fit into this defense, but they they will like his physicality. If he makes the team, I think he'll contribute on special teams. He's probably going to have to take Chris Claybrooks' job, who got like 200 snaps last year. So uh, you'll have a little bit of competition down there. Keep an eye on Josh Thompson out of Texas as well. Really athletic guy. Uh, but I had a pretty rough write up on him. He really had no idea what he was doing in zone coverage. But uh, in man, maybe could stand out. Maybe stands out on special teams or practice squad or something like that. Good athlete. And then as we get to the safety group, it is a deep group lacking any sort of notable talent at all. Um, I do like Andre Cisco. He finally got on the field late last season and was a playmaker. Excellent run defender. We'll get to that. Uh, definitely has to answer. Um, I'm not going to say answer questions in coverage. Just needs to prove that he can be a good coverage player. We liked what we saw from Syracuse as kind of a rangy center fielder type. He'll get to do some of that here good upside for him he's full size he's got speed heavy hitting dude uh seems to have a good head on his shoulder i i think andre cisco should get the start here it's no guarantee you really have a lot of bodies here that are going to be competing um, but i would expect andre cisco to get the start just because they spent a third round pick on him last year he played well late last season why not see what he can do that other safety position honestly could be any of these four guys i listed andrew wingard because he's the best cover player of these four. Uh, Wingard's a really heady cover guy, good ball skills, um, reads the QB's eyes very well, and and breaks on stuff basically a, a step ahead of what Rayshon Jenkins or Rudy Ford or Daniel Thomas would be doing. So I bet he holds on to that job, um, but physical limitations and a horrible run defender, um, whereas Rayshon Jenkins is kind of the opposite. Downhill dude, really good tackler, full-size guy with speed, but doesn't really know what he's looking at in coverage. So they're paying Rayshon Jenkins, but Andrew Wingert's the better cover player. Those are your two favorites for your number two safety spot. Again, it's it's going to be very much up in the air in this defense. They've always had kind of your traditional free safety, strong safety relationship. So if Cisco's your free safety, it might make more sense that Rayshon Jenkins is starting as your more strong safety type very much in the air. So it's going to be a matter of preference um, as far as who's going to be that number two safety, assuming Cisco starts. It could be Wingard and Jenkins. Um, you have Rudy Ford, who was another Urban Meyer kind of fast special teamer type. He's not bad as a dime back. He plays a little slot corner, a little strong safety, kind of a matchup guy, can handle speedy slot options good tackler, really good special teamer. He's a useful player. I don't see him as a full-time starter. And then Daniel Thomas is another player I like. He's another more traditional strong safety type, not the best mover in space, not the best long speed or coverage instincts, um, but I think will push Rayshon Jenkins for that more strong safety consideration if they want more of that run defender on the field. I really like Daniel Thomas and Honestly, I think there's a good chance he's better than Rayshon Jenkins in year three here. We just haven't seen him do that consistently. Um, but Thomas did play late in the year last year and played pretty well. Um, these other two guys, Russ Knack and Oyalola, probably not going to be room for them to make it. So there is your pass defense ranking 31st in the league. Some pretty obvious questions there. Uh, but I think all pretty justifiable. And the upside here is honestly for this to be a top 20 pass defense. I, I wouldn't be stunned. Um, just so many things to be answered here to come into the year ranking too high. Run defense now is going to rank 25th. You got a really deep D-line up front. Fadu Kasi is one of my favorites. This dude's one of the better nose tackles in the league. There's no way around it. You also have Malcolm Brown and De Devon Hamilton, Jay Tufele. Pretty good two, three, four defensive tackle, nose tackle rotation there. Uh, I feel pretty solid about that. I feel more than solid about that. In fact, for the D-line run defense, they rank 14th. 
Um, but that also includes Trayvon Walker on the edge and Josh Allen on the edge. I mean, Trayvon Walker is a rookie, but his run defense has the potential to be the best run defending edge in the league sooner rather than um, later. That was a big part of why he got drafted number one was with his size and strength and athleticism, he had rare length and he would attach those long arms and shed with ease. So yes, there might be a transition as a rookie, but man, he could be an elite run defender day one. And if he is, you might be getting a top 10 defensive line from a run defense perspective. You know, Roy Robertson Harris is going to see the field a lot and he is not a very good run defender. He's a high effort guy, but he is undersized. Um, Josh Allen's also a pretty high effort guy, but sometimes he can play a little bit too high and get taken out of the play as a stand-up edge. Um, but he's far from a liability. Uh, any other depth worth noting on the D-line? Dwayne Smoot, Arden Keat? Not really. Most of the rest of the guys are more pass rush developmental guys um, as the edge depth. Um, but then interior defensive line. But then the linebacking group. I do think this is a better cover group than a run defending group, mostly because of Foya Setaluakun. The dude's 215 pounds. He's basically a safety. Like, he's just going to get bodied in the run game. It's just going to happen. But he tries his best. Uh, when he can come from the backside, he will have that sort of um, open field production where he can run and chase and tackle really well. So that's an asset. He's just, he's not going to meet you in the hole and stack and shed against a guard or a fullback. It's just not going to happen from him. Devin Lloyd, yeah, he can do that. He's a full-size guy. A good run defender in college. I wouldn't say he was an elite run defender. I think he's he's always playing with his head. He's always reading what's going on. And sometimes he's a little bit easier to get blocked because of that, or he's not always shooting gaps. Uh, but it's, you know, eventually he gets there. He's just not like blowing stuff up in the run game. Uh, he also had a decent amount of missed tackles in college. I think he'll clean that stuff up, but it is a question mark. Um, the linebacker depth. Chad Muma, I think there's going to be a lot of 4-3 base here as well, I, I would expect. I mean, really, drafting Chad Muma is the only thing that indicates that that's going to be the case, to be honest. Maybe they really just really liked him, and they wanted a good backup linebacker. I don't know. In theory, they could have a really good group of three and run a good 4-3 here with Robertson Harris as an edge and, um, you know, taking maybe... You, know, you could do a lot of stuff with this front is basically what I'm saying. And Chad Muma gives you that flexibility to run a, a three linebacker package. Uh, young guy for sure, but a good run defender. And I think if he sees the field, will develop pretty quickly as a, as a rookie there. Um, Shaq Quarterman is a very good run defender. If they had to go to the depth, he's just a liability in coverage. Year three there for Quarterman. Tyrell Adams has played a lot in this league. He's a decent backup to have there. Uh, so there's your linebacker room. It's a decent group in run defense. Very average, in my opinion. Uh, then the DB run support. I am a little worried about Darius Williams playing in the slot there. Uh, that's actually a little bit of a knock. Uh, he's played good when he can play in space and kind of run and chase in off-zone coverage. Uh, but from the slot, he's never been a great run defender. So we'll see how he can hold up. Uh, again, assuming that's where he plays, mostly. That signing, again, just didn't add up to me with the way the rest of the scheme falls into place um, but man griffin and campbell very physical corners that's about as physical as they come for a duo so uh, if you're worried about derrick henry and jonathan taylor getting the edge on outside zone you have a couple of good corners to try and slow that down um, the safeties aren't giving you a whole lot in run defense uh, cisco is the one with really good potential there uh, someone that's been more of a free safety in his career, but played in the box uh, late last year when he did get on the field and really, really looked pretty good. He had a, a run stuff against the Colts in week 18 that was just like, whoa, okay, against Jonathan Taylor that was like, all right, this guy this guy can play in the box for sure. So Cisco's definitely a player uh, I'm excited to see maybe break out here in year two. Um, but we kind of talked about the rest of these safeties. Like it's... Uh, Rashawn Jenkins and Daniel Thomas are much better run defending safeties, but I think there's a decent chance Wingard starts because Wingard's such a much better cover player. Daniel Thomas being the really interesting 
one there because I think he's a phenomenal box safety. It's just the coverage for him is a massive question mark. But there you go. There is your defensive breakdown. Now they rank 29th for total defense. Um, a lot of potential. A lot of potential there. A lot of new pieces. A lot of you know new scheme, new players, young players. A lot of question marks to be answered across the board. It's going to be tough to rank that high coming into the year when that's the case. But if you get the right development here, it's not just about maybe Trevor Lawrence looks good. It's this defense. All of these pieces make sense together. Other than with the exception, I would say of um, Darius Williams in the slot. All these pieces make a lot of sense. You have a potentially really good scheme coming in. You could have a new Todd Bowles here with Dave Caldwell. Uh, but it just it has to all be proven on the field before we can uh, get too excited about this group. Uh, so your team rankings as a whole, 31st, of course, 29th for offense, 29th for defense. And I am going to bring back the schedule prediction. Uh, check Twitter, guys, if you want to see the Texans one. Um, some of you guys said you missed this from last year's deep dive when I didn't put it in the Texans episode. So uh, we're bringing it back. I'm doing it a little bit differently instead of saying this is a win, this is a loss, and given my win-loss prediction, you know, that would always change when I do my end of se or my preseason prediction show. I'll do my official predictions for that video right before the season starts. This is more accurately represents how I went about it in the past. I would kind of say, are you more likely or not to win that game? So I came up with a kind of a system here. There's three categories for these games. You're either likely to win the game, it's a winnable game, or you're likely to lose the game. And I basically identify what all these games are, and it spits out sort of my own over-under for the team. So I'm excited about this. Um, I played around with the, the winning splits there, 20%, 40%, 80%, and... I like this formula a lot. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. But uh, here we go for the Jags. So I have them with nine likely losses on the schedule. They have to play the AFC West. So that's going to be pretty tough there for sure. Uh, but they do play the NFC East and the AFC South, of course. So uh, even if they rank 31st, you know, they might pick up a couple extra wins here getting to play the Giants and Washington and the Texans twice. Like, you could have worse schedules than this. So I do project them at just over five wins for the 31st ranked team, which is under their Vegas over under. Vegas has them at six and a half, and it does pay minus 134 to bet the under. So all of the money is on the under at that number. And basically, I agree. I think they're about a five or a six win team this year. Um, but lots of potential in there. I think, you know, if you get six wins and you feel really good about Trevor Lawrence and this young defense, like guys like Trayvon Walker and Josh Allen and Cisco and your, your secondary and these linebackers all kind of come together and make sense. You can really have that big leap from this year to next year. I don't think it's going to happen this year. I don't think this is a playoff team, but um, there is a lot of potential for them to get there um, if all this stuff comes together. So there is your Jacksonville Jaguars deep dive. I really hope you guys enjoyed. Again, please do hit that like button. Uh, just one little click down below goes a long way towards supporting my channel and pushing this video out to the rest of YouTube. That YouTube algorithm is very powerful and the likes are what fuel it. So seriously, please do hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe so you do not miss any of these deep dives as we go. Let me know in the comments down below what you think of this ranking. And until next time, thank you for watching. We'll see you for the next deep dive. Peace out.